Father, we come to you again thanking you for all the blessings you have given us and for all the, the support and all the happiness that we have. We'd ask that you be with those who were mentioned here this morning and those that, that only you know about the, the sick and the, the hurting and those who have lost loved ones. Be with us in all things. Your Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our next song will be No Not One, hymn 609, will be verses 1, 2, and 5, so three times through, 1, 2, and 5, No Not One. chain. 
he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who was the devil or Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which we were seated, on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God, and they had not worshipped the beast or his image or had not received the mark on his foreheads or their hands, and they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And then the passage continues. Uh, we'll make reference to it a little later on. But here is where we get the idea of this concept of the millennium. Six times here in these verses, and a few coming after it, uh, we have this description of a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. And there's sometimes when you come to Revelation and you're trying to get an interpretation of what it must be like, there are differences of opinion, and I understand that. I mean, my opinions have changed uh, even uh, during the course of uh, studying uh, this past, uh, these passages. Uh, and so we learn and we grow in our faith in that way. But there are some people who would say, wait a minute, as an all millennialist, I don't believe in a literal thousand year reign. You know, the thousand years to some interpretations would be the reign of the church here on earth, waiting for Jesus to return, and then when Jesus returns, it's over. That would be the perception that some would have, and then we would go uh, to heaven or our destination uh, etern uh, to uh, eternal uh, presence with God or damnation uh, separated from God in that perspective. But here we have in this passage several different phrases. In fact, the words used a thousand years. And so as we look at that, we have to come to a conclusion on what it means. And I think it helps us to see that there is this needs to be taken very literally, particularly because of the number of times it's used, obviously, but the way that it's used. It's used as a time period. You'll note that it says we will reign with Christ for a thousand years, and that Satan is bound for a thousand years. And then at the end of the thousand years, uh, Satan is let loose. And so there is a particular time element to it as it describes the different events that will happen here in this situation. It's the reference to the ending uh, of the world. I mean, some of, the, of those who have calculated uh, the existence of uh, our planet have come to the conclusion, if you go back through the generations uh, of the Bible, that we've been around about 6,000 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we see the way that God works in his completeness, we know that seven is one of those uh, numbers that he uses for completeness, for his perfection. And so that leaves us with a thousand years that would happen there at the end if Jesus and the tribulation uh, would all happen uh, here in the next little bit. Uh, at the same time, we also have to see it as a chronological nature of this passage here in Revelation 20. We've gone through all of the events up to this point. We've talked about judgment. We've talked about what God has done to the earth. We've discussed all of the different things up to this chapter. And if you read the Bible chronologically, then we come to this conclusion that after these things happen, then, as the, the verse starts in verse 1, we have this thousand-year reign. Uh, of Christ. Not only that, we also have to see it uh, as the spiritual battle between God and devil, the big showdown. Uh, and we need to say it more appropriately. Uh, maybe it's not God and the devil, it's God and his plan, or God against humans, or God against the will of humans, or God just showing his love. There's different descriptions to help be more accurate in, in that description depiction, uh, but we have to see it in all of these different levels, I think it leads us to that very idea of a literal thousand years. And so, how does the text begin? The text says an angel comes down out of heaven and grabs a hold of Satan and binds him for a thousand years in the abyss. Chapter 19 told us when Jesus came back that he took the beast, the in person, the the person uh, who, the Antichrist and the false prophet, and they were thrown, if you have the end of chapter 19 open in your Bibles, the, they were thrown into the lake of fire. There's a dis distinction of, about where they are in these different places. The beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire at the end of 19. Satan is picked up and is captured, uh, and he is put into this bottomless pit, this abyss, as it is made reference to uh, here at the beginning of chapter 20, to be bound only then, as the Bible tells us, to be released uh, later on. Again, don't confuse this with a dualistic nature of the world. It is not God against Satan. 
Satan is not as powerful as God. We read this passage, and we also have to understand as we read the angel come down and binding Satan, that that angel could have been sent by God at any time in any point of history because God is that powerful. He could have bound Satan for any amount of time. He could have ended Satan at any point, but as we see Scripture unfold, God has a plan. And so there is a portion for him to do that at this time, and he stays true uh, to his plan. So, after all this judgment and victory and redemption and thwarted and evil, we land on this thousand-year period, and we have questions. Why do we have questions? We'll look back at your scripture. If you'll notice, here in Revelation, uh, chapter 20, we get one verse to describe this thousand years. And you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, God, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We have gone into all kinds of descriptions about images and signs uh, and seeing these different beasts uh, and these grotesque pictures of judgment of what God is going to do. And it gives us quite a bit of detail, but yet when we get to this millennium, one verse, <laughs> it's right there in verse 4, uh, you see the transition, uh, it talks about, I saw thrones which were seated on the authority, or uh, Verse 3 talks about Satan being bound for uh, that thousand years. And then we see this picture of thrones and authority and people who are uh, reigning with Christ. Uh, and then at the very end, as we get to verses 5, 6, and 7, uh, verse 7 is already when the thousand years are over. We have that much that is given to us to understand this millennium. Why? Maybe because the writer John understood that we should already know a lot about this because the millennium is what is made reference to all throughout the Old Testament. When we read the prophets, all the prophets, and if you ever wondered if you ever started reading the Bible, and you get through those Old Testament prophets, and you get to the Ezekiel, and you get to uh, Obadiah, and uh, Zechariah, and you're like, what in the world is he talking about? What I want to show you today is that several of their discussions have an impact in describing what this thousand year reign of Christ at the end of time will be like. I mean, we start with just regular kingdom verses. Uh, the, when Jesus arrives here on earth in the book of Matthew, he starts talking about the kingdom. In fact, that's what John the Baptist says, right? John the Baptist says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. And we get to the Beatitudes, and one of Jesus' well, best known sermons, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Later on in that passage, uh, he says, uh, Matthew 6, 33 was on the screen at the very beginning of the service, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. We get this idea about the kingdom as soon as Jesus shows up. And it does make me wonder, one of the questions I think I need to ask God when we get to heaven is, was it your plan, God, when Jesus came to earth the first, first time to set up this reign and the Jews just messed it up? <laughs> you know, their rejection of him at this point, as the gospel unfolds in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that a direct missing from humanity where this kingdom could have already been taken care of? We don't know. God has a plan. Uh, God does use mankind in his way for his purposes. But you have to wonder, because when Jesus stands there in front of Pilate as he is on trial, what does he say? My kingdom is not from this world. Jesus shows up to be king, to rule and reign, and he is rejected. God, um, as eternal, uh, as the eternal almighty supreme power in his divinity, knows what mankind was going to do. And so I don't think that there is a plan B, but as the way it was set up, we see this issue of the kingdom, even with the words of Jesus, in his first coming. He is talking about what it means to be a part uh, of uh, the kingdom. Uh, we have all the way through the Old Testament other references to this kingdom. You remember Daniel, uh, the, the book that goes really well with some of the apocalyptic prophecies of the book of Revelation. Uh, Daniel uh, interprets this dream for Nebuchadnezzar uh, about this image, and it is broken down into uh, different kingdoms and how the head represents a kingdom, uh, and then the torso represents a kingdom, and then the legs represent a kingdom, and, and then Daniel says there's going to be this rock that comes and crushes all of the rest of these kingdoms and sets up an eternal kingdom forever. This kingdom has been talked about, and we've gotten descriptions from it, uh, is what I'm trying to get you to, commu to communicate to you all the way through. In fact, uh, 
In, in fact, uh, as the disciples uh, are nearing the end of Jesus' ministry, they expect the kingdom of God to come immediately. Jesus starts telling them that he's going to leave, and they get really confused because they're looking forward to this kingdom. Uh, and at one point in Luke chapter 19, they have this discussion, and Jesus, to give them perspective, tells them this parable, and he tells them a parable about a steward, who a landowner, who leaves, and he places his land uh, in control of a steward, and he's gone for a long time, only then to return and take place of this kingdom. So when this kingdom was supposed to happen uh, has been told all throughout Scripture, and here we find it uh, in Revelation chapter 20 in the discussion uh, of the millennium. But what is this kingdom going to be like? Oh, I'm just going to put some verses uh, up here on the screen and make reference to them. Uh, if you can see them, great. If not, we can get some passages later. Uh, just start reading your Old Testament prophets and you're going to come across uh, all of these different passages. Uh, but Zechariah 14 uh, tells us that the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name alone will be worshipped. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, uh, it's the passage that we know from Christmas time, right? For unto us a child is born, uh, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice, with righteousness from this time forth and forever. It's talking about a kingdom. And as we see the depictions of it, we can come to the conclusion that this kingdom is Jesus' reigning not just in the heavenly realm, but he sets up his kingdom here on earth. Elsewhere, in Isaiah chapter 2, uh, he talks about uh, maybe some of the more known passages about the kingdom. Uh, he will judge among the nations, it says, and will rebuke many people, and they will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift sword up against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. And we have to ask ourselves, has that ever happened yet? No, <laughs> pretty obvious. Hasn't happened yet. It's Bible prophecy. It's going to happen. When is it going to happen? And we come to the conclusion that this is what the rule of Jesus is about, the kingdom that he is going to set up. Elsewhere, it talks in Jeremiah 3, uh, that at that time, the Lord will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. They will call the Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations will be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, neither will they walk anymore after the imagination of their evil heart. God's going to set up a kingdom, and he's going to set it up there in Israel and use the city of Jerusalem as its capital in that respect. Ezekiel chapter 37, my dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord and sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is among them forevermore. Uh, another kingdom issue from the prophets time and again. In fact, uh, one of the other ones that we are more familiar with, uh, the whole lion laying down with the lamb, Isaiah chapter 11. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The little boy will lead them. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. Nature is going to change during this reign. And these are depictions of the Old Testament passages on what it's going to be like. Whew, catch my breath uh, and, and go on. Uh, and then what, as we understand uh, what this millennium, this reign of Jesus is going to be like, it is going to change the world that we live in. We've already talked about the changes that God's judgment is going to bring upon the world. But as Jesus sets up his throne, don't miss the fact that it's not just changing the world, but the most important part of the kingdom is that Jesus rules, and that it's about bringing people to Jesus. It's about bringing people to salvation. Uh, Isaiah 52 talks about how beautiful upon the mountain are the ones who bring good news, and talks about how the King, the Lord, establishes his kingdom uh, there in heaven. Uh, Joel chapter 2, this is the passage that Peter refers to uh, at Pentecost, when he is trying to convince people that at some point every day will bow before Jesus and all people need to come to the knowledge of Jesus. He says, I will pour out my spirit upon people, uh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my spirit on the servants, men and women alike, and talk about ruling and reigning in the following verses to that. 
So when Jesus comes, he's going to come for the reason of bringing people to him. And as he rules, he will rule justly. He will rule truthfully. Uh, so that we can come to the conclusion that when Jesus rules, there will be peace on earth for a thousand years. We make the reference already to that. How they will learn war no more. What else is going to be about this kingdom? Uh, he will abolish war warfare. He will establish peace. Social justice will prevail in every class. Messiah will teach mankind uh, the worthwhile relationships that are based upon uh, the truth. In politics, uh, the Bible reminds us all throughout the Old Testament uh, that Jesus will establish himself as the international authority. There will be a world capital. There will be a one world government at that time. And that government will be Jesus on his throne in Jerusalem. That's what the Bible tells us in, through all these passages. And so as we put these people together, that's the appropriate conclusion to come to. It says that all different languages will cease. There won't be a barrier of languages anymore. That we will know Jesus uh, in that respect. Uh, and later on it talks about with religion's sake. Uh, there will be no other religion. Everyone will worship Jesus. Uh, back in uh, Zechariah it says that if people don't come to worship Jesus, uh, they will not get rain upon their grounds during these thousand years. Uh, you will be forced uh, to worship Jesus because he is good. And in fact, you will want to worship Jesus uh, for all of these purposes because of what he is and what he does for us. There will not be any other religions during this thousand year reign of Jesus. It will just be Jesus ruling as a priest and king uh, over us. It talks about in Ezekiel chapter uh, 40 and following that there even will be a temple of some sorts in Jerusalem. And we have to sort through that. And we'll have a little bit of time to talk about that uh, maybe even next week as we look at the different people who are part of the kingdom. The kingdom is also about giving the people of Israel back their land. Just as tribulation was given, the seven years of tribulation, to bring Israel to the point of acknowledging Jesus as Lord, the millennium was given to give them the covenant promises fulfillment that God made to Abraham, that God made to David, that God made to the children of Israel as they were crossing over into the promised land the first time. If they follow him, he will set up his kingdom for them to reign with him. It talks about during the millennium uh, that the topography of the world will be different. Uh, that the climate change will be different uh, to increase the rainfall so that we don't have to worry uh, about um, farming and, or taking care of plants at all. That all of that will be given in some way going back to the way that it was at, at the Garden of Eden. That it's going to alter the nature of animals. We talked about the lion uh, and the lamb laying down together. That it will let na the nation of Israel increase its boundaries and have more influence uh, because that's where Jesus will be. It says that during this kingdom that the Messiah will also change the physical welfare by putting an end to diseases uh, and any uh, deformities uh, that have been a part of our physical world up to this point. All of those things will be changed as the goodness of Christ sits on the throne. And you may say, well, wait a minute. There are those who will hear all of these prophecies in the Old Testament and will say, maybe that's already happened. Do we actually have to have this literal thousand-year reign of Jesus? They will say, well, the Israelites were brought back into the Promised Land after their Babylonian exile. Can we find these prophecies being fulfilled there? Not specifically. They'll say, what about the, when the nation of Israel was brought back in the 60s? When they got to come back into their land from being scattered all throughout the world? Is that the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies? Israel is not uh, the one world government that it says it will be. And so we have to come to the conclusion that it's not just a spiritualized understanding of this thousand year period that Jesus has a specific thousand year reign with Christ here on this earth. And again, there may be some of you who are like, well, that's not really what I believe, and that's okay. This is not a salvation issue. <laughs> Having a different belief in the millennium is not going to keep you out of heaven, but this is what the Bible says. And as we understand it very literally, it's easy to see the conclusions that he makes that gets us to this point. The other issue sometimes that we have is what, what about heaven? 
When it comes to eternal things, we get confused about different levels and understandings of those things, right? When we start talking about heaven and what heaven's going to be like, sometimes we go back to those scriptures in the Old Testament that are talking about the kingdom. Are they going to be that different? Jesus is going to reign both of them. Probably not going to be that different. But there is some differences that are given between the kingdom of heaven, as we get to the last two chapters here in the book of Revelation, and this little interval of a thousand years that we get one verse for uh, in Revelation chapter 20, uh, while Satan is still bound so that there can be peace and that there can be truth before he is released again uh, to be done away with uh, finally and thrown then from the abyss into the lake of fire uh, for the rest of eternity. So we get to that conclusion then, uh, you know, how do we understand the differences between this kingdom and heaven? There are going to be some differences to that. The Bible tells us that land will be different. In heaven, the Bible says there will be no sea. Chapter 21, verse 1. <laughs> There's no longer any sea. But when we read pictures of the kingdom, we have pictures of the oceans, of the earth being restored after the judgment that God gives during the tribulation. It tells us that unbelievers are going to be different. As we read the passages about the kingdom in the Old Testament, it talks about people still not believing in Jesus and because of their sin, still dying. That's inconsistent with heaven. There will not be unbelievers in heaven. When it comes to eternally living with Jesus, it will just be Christians. And we'll talk about some of the different people next week as we discuss the white throne judgment here at the end of chapter 20 of the different people who are going to be a part of the kingdom some of the church who have been raptured, who have been redeemed, who have been given glorified bodies. But when Jesus comes back, there are still more people here on this earth in their natural forms. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what happens with them. There's a difference between heaven and the, this millennial reign of Jesus, even in death. It makes reference to people dying in the kingdom. Not believers. Not those who have been with glorified bodies who are already spiritual. So there's nothing for the Christian to worry about in that perspective. But it doesn't mention death uh, in those times. And so we have this incompatibility to believe that there is something different than just we live and we die and we go to heaven. That God's plan is very literal as we get here through this book of Revelation to understand what he gives to us. And also children are different. Children are being born in the kingdom. Children are not being born in heaven. That's the end of time. When people are at their conclusion. When we have everybody that we will ever have at that point. And so we have these inconsistencies of both of these issues. So that leads us back to the text. What about you? Where will you be in the kingdom? Let's go back to verse 4 and read that verse again. I saw thrones on which are seated those who have been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who have been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads and their, or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. There's a passage here, the only passage that we have in Revelation about the millennium, of Jesus reigning and those who have died for Jesus reigning with him. This is a direct implication of the tribulation saints. They lost their life. They did not take the mark of the beast. And so as Jesus comes back at Revelation chapter 19, uh, in his power and authority, those who have died because of the beast are raised up, and they get a direct chance to reign with Christ. But the good news is, church, that all throughout Scripture we also have those promises. Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 2, both passages that were written to the church says, and he has made us to be a kingdom and a priest to serve God and his Father and to be glory and power forever and ever. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 26, uh, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. Uh, Revelation chapter 5, before the seals are even broken, you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. The Bible reminds us that God has a place for the church. Those who have been raptured and who come back with him, that army that rides with Jesus on his white horse, 
not really an army because Jesus is the only one who does the fighting, but the Bible describes us riding with Jesus at that time. Those who are a part uh, of the church and who have glorified bodies will get to come back to earth during this millennium and reign with Christ. We will have the government job. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. This is not just Revelation passages. Both Paul and John indicate that believers will reign with Christ in 1 Corinthians and 2 Timothy, uh, and again uh, in the earlier parts uh, of Revelation. I say all this to talk about uh, the millennium to help us understand what the Bible says. We come to this very important passage because it sets up the way that we have interpreted the Bible, uh, the, the book of Revelation up to this point. Jesus' is gut coming back and God's giving judgments. Jesus is going to reign on earth. And that's what the Bible says. And as we take it literally, this is the conclusion that we get to. That Jesus will set up a kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. That's what the Bible says. And we will be able to be with him, ruling and reigning. We'll talk a little bit more specifically about how that may happen. The Bible doesn't say what details we will have. It doesn't say what jobs will be out there. But it does say that we will be able to be with Christ, helping and ruling and serving uh, as kings and priests, <laughs> as people with authority, and as people who continue to bring people to God. You know, the amazing part of it is, it's not that much different from the position that God has given you today in His kingdom. Those of you who have believed in Jesus, who have the Spirit of God in your life, you have a job. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go and make disciples. Go and be a witness of what God has done for you. And I think that that's exactly what our job is going to be like here in the kingdom. There still will be some unbelievers who don't know Jesus. And our opportunity will be to continue to show them how great the love of God is. What God has done for us. What God has done all throughout eternity and what God continues to do to working uh, for his people. We have a place, we have a position, we have a purpose. We are to witness to those of God's goodness. The question that we come down to is this. Can you handle that job? There's a lot of times when we think about what it means to be a Christian. We just want part of it, right? <laughs> when it comes to God king, God's kingdom, it's not just a partial place. You're either all with him, or you're not with him. God knows that. He knows as long as we live in these mortal bodies that there is that sin nature in us, that will problem, uh, our will against God's will, our desire, our cravings, uh, our lust, the things that pull us away from acknowledging who God is. But what God continues to do is place you in situations where you can grow in your faith and be that witness that he needs, that he uses, to reach other people for him and for his love. When you think about all the people who are alive on this earth today, it's overwhelming. There's a lot of people. And you put that in the picture of, you think about all the people who have been alive over time. That's a lot of people. Uh, and even as we get to the kingdom of a thousand years uh, here on earth, uh, the repopulation that can happen is going to be a lot of people. And the bigness of God uh, is sometimes we forget. Sometimes we only see God through our little country church lens. Sometimes we only see God through our American lens. Sometimes we only see God through our I'm not too bad off, I'm okay kind of a lens. But the reality is there is a world, literally, <laughs> filled with people who need to know the love of God. Don't wait for the millennium to start your job and be a witness for Jesus. It's not just good enough to come and sit in your pew on Sunday morning. If that's where you are right now, great. God is there saying, okay, step up. All right, <laughs> use words. Uh, all right, tell somebody how good I am. Tell what I have done for you. Give me glory. Give me praise because I need to use you to reach them so that as we get to the time of this book of Revelation, as it comes to its conclusion in giving us the eternity of heaven and hell, there will be those who have been influenced by us because of Jesus who can give God glory 
because we were faithful witnesses in their life. The story of the millennium, I think, is just that. For the church, it's the story of where we are today. You are called to be a witness of the love of Jesus to your world. Not just the people who live in your house, although she should start there. Not just the people who live in your community, although it should also start there. But God pushes, and God stretches, and God challenges us to continue to be that witness, that faithful witness for Him. One day, you will be working for the man. And the good news is, he's a good man. The good news is, there's nothing to be ashamed about his judgments. The good news is, you'll be proud to wear the, the shirt that has the logo, uh, that has the name, uh, that has the connection uh, to who Jesus is as a ruler and reigner on this earth in preparation uh, for heaven uh, to come. God provides for us a place to be a part of the kingdom. And I think that's amazing. Take hold of that now. See that challenge. And get your life right with the Lord. So that you can be that witness for Him. That you can use your conversations to give Him credit and praise that is due Him. We come to the time of our service. To say, okay. It's decision time. We're going to sing a little song in a little bit and give you a chance to respond. I'm not sure where you all are. I know we all have those parts of our minds at work, those parts of our hearts that lead us around as we try to make the decisions that we need to make. But I know the call of God is real on every one of our hearts. God calls us all to be His children. And the way that we're His children is if we submit to Him and confess our sins repent of them and are baptized into Jesus and then faithfully walk. It's about faith. It's about taking steps and believing that God is going to be who He says He will be as we read His Word, as we hear the witness of other people. It's always about faith with God as we can grow in our faith and make a difference for His kingdom. Where are you in that step? If you need to help in making those decisions, that's why we sang the song. A chance to say, hey, I want to do something different. Hey, I need help. Call, talk with us. We want to help you in your, your steps with Jesus so that you can be uh, a good worker in his kingdom. The hymn of decision today is number 684. Precious Lord, uh, take my hand. If you need to respond uh, to the call of Jesus on your life, uh, come forward uh, as we stand and sing that song. 684, Precious Lord, take my hand. Please stand. <laughs> with us. Uh, that means in the same thing that we just talked about, he plans on being a witness for God through this congregation. So it's our responsibility uh, to encourage him uh, and for you to encourage us uh, too in that respect. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you to repeat the good confession uh, that Peter uh, said to Jesus. Uh, I believe I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ, the Son of the living God. Son of the living God. Congratulations. Congratulations. Let's pray uh, for them. Father God, thank you so much uh, for the understanding of who we are with people. Uh, Lord, we know that you have a relationship with us, and that relationship is perfect. But we also know that you've put us here with people that we can love and encourage and share with them through this journey. And we thank you for Devin in that respect. And we ask that you can help us uh, to encourage him along uh, on his way. And then, Lord, that you can use him uh, to encourage others. We thank you for your church worldwide. We just ask that your presence, your peace, and your direction can be with us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Congratulations, sir.
Why don't you sit down? We go ahead and back sit there with your, with your family if you want to. As we move along with uh, our service, uh, we now come to uh, our hymn, uh, of Holy, 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 page number three. Uh, so if you have your hymnals out and will turn to that with me, uh, we will invite the young people back in as we continue our service. Holy, 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 uh, let's do the first uh, and the fourth verse of number three, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Thank you. 